Hi there, Jim. Finola here in Cambridge. We meet today in March 2021, roughly a month away from the publication of the long expected second edition of Refugee Rights and International Law. You and I are in agreement that this should be read alongside the previous classic Law of Refugee Status, second edition of which you co-authored with Michelle Foster in Melbourne, and which Cambridge also had the pleasure of publishing in 2014. You've always talked to me about the synergies between the two books. Would you like to say a bit more about that, please? So look, I think there are two big questions uh, in international refugee law, right? One is who's a refugee? And the second is what are their rights? Uh, there are other questions that border the political, like how do we make the systems work? Uh, how do we ensure its funding? All of those questions. But for the lawyer, the, the, the two core questions are refugee status and refugee rights. And, and most books in the field deal with both of those things together, and they add in some of the broader systemic questions like the role of agencies and other things. I decided that I wanted to produce books that really went into great depth on the two core questions of international refugee law. So one on entitlement to status, the law of refugee status, and one on what follows from that entitlement, the rights of refugees under international law, and to make sure that for the policymaker, the lawyer, the judge, who really wants to understand where the norms came from and how they are applied across the world today, there was a book that would really provide that answer in great depth. And so you're right, reading the two books as, as companions provides the, in my sense, uh, whole of the answer that I'm able to give to the biggest questions in refugee law. So let's turn then to the first edition of Refugee Rights Under International Law, all the way back in 2005, when yeah. indeed it won the American Society of International Law Certificate of Merit. Congratulations. Thank you. What's happened in the last 16 years in the field to warrant this update now? Um, well, I mean, good news and bad news, right? So let, let's get the bad news out of the way. Uh, the, the lives of refugees are, are infinitely more difficult than they were 15 years ago. We have more barriers to access, for example, more barriers to access that operate extraterritorially than they did previously, more constraints on freedom of movement, less ability to access work or social welfare, uh, and probably worst of all, uh, solutions to refugeehood are in decline. Uh, you know, we now have only about one half of 1% of the world's protracted refugee population being resettled each year. Uh, that's disastrous. So that's, that's our challenge. Uh, the good news is that this book is conceived as an amalgam of understanding the Refugee Convention and the core norms of international human rights law, particularly the two human rights covenants. We now are at a position where 98% of the world's refugees live in a country that is party to both of those covenants. So we have legal remedies that we didn't have to the same extent 15 years ago. Uh, that's fabulous. We also have more supranational courts involved in adjudicating refugee rights than in the past. The advent of the Court of Justice of the European Union is huge, but courts in Africa and the inter-American system have also engaged refugee rights pretty dramatically, as have an increasing number of national courts around the world. There are something like 30 countries' national courts practice that are surveyed in the book. And, and, and lastly, but not least, the UN human rights bodies, the treaty bodies, have begun much more seriously to engage the rights of refugees than 15 years ago. So the jurisprudence of the treaty bodies, their general comments are much more on point and prolific than they were. So we both have more problems and more legal avenues to address those problems than I think we did 15 years ago. So much more complex landscape and all the more reason for a great second edition. I was reading through the introduction to your 
second edition last night at home and was struck by your comment on the growth and comparative jurisprudence. Um, you've just been echoing that. So people can look forward, I think, in this edition to seeing a far more range of, of courts and tribunals covered. I wanted to skip back quickly to the same issue with regard to law of refugee status, somewhat sentimentally, because I worked for Butterworths, who were the publisher of the first edition of this um, in Canada in the early 90s when I was in Ireland. And in those days, publishers didn't even export their books outside their own regions. So, so we're in a different world today. Um, anyway, coming back to the new edition of Refugee Rights, the table of contents, which is the sort of thing is meat and drink to me as an editor. Um, I'm just comparing the first edition and the second edition, and I see that the core chapters on rights of refugees, chapters four to seven, are, are, are exactly there with the same chapter titles, obviously updated. Um, however, I see that you tweaked uh, the titles of the of the early chapters, and I just wondered if you'd speak to me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I would say the, the basic architecture is the same, but there are some completely new points of emphasis. For example, all five of the existing and emerging regional refugee protection systems uh, are addressed in the book, uh, which I think is important. Uh, some issues that have become really complex, like the duty of non-refoulement, not to send refugees back, including asylum seekers back, before we know that they uh, fail the test for entitlement. I mean, there's more than 100 pages just on that one right. That's almost a book in itself. Uh, and it's been subdivided into much more specific issues so that people can find things more easily. The chapters on uh, detention and expulsion are dramatically expanded, as are the chapters on solutions to refugeehood. So the idea really was to, and, and this is the real core of the book, uh, unlike most books in international law, this is designed to be a book that responds to the facts on the ground. And, and to be frank, Vanilla, this is the thing about the book that I'm most proud, that it's, it's not just a treatise on the convention and the covenants. It's anchored in literally thousands of case studies from around the world that I had a team working on for something like five years to find examples of what really is happening in every corner of the globe right now to refugees that we've recapitulated in the book as the opening of every chapter. And then the law is analyzed up against those facts. And I come back to the facts and explain how I think the law ought to be applied in relation to them. So this is a book that doesn't pull any punches. It, it's not abstract. It's not just a theoretical book. It's a book that mines history and jurisprudence in order to come up with a coherent theory of refugee rights and then applies that to the hard facts of refugee life on the ground right now. So that updating was a huge part of this book, right? The really what's happening today around the world uh, figures prominently in the structure of the book. Everyone must have it, therefore, I think. Well, I'd like to think so. But, yeah. you know, ser seriously, it, it's it's one of those things where I think as lawyers, we're often we're often caught, right? Because we do want to be relevant. And, and yet it's not always our expertise to mine social science, literature, the, the media, et cetera, in order to really unearth all of those facts that make the law live. And, and I have been blessed by a really fabulous team of social science researchers who worked over the last five years to really come to grips with the dirty reality of what's happening in all parts of the world. It's not just north and south, it's everywhere refugee rights are under it. And once you see that, I think it really makes the law live a chapter, let's say, about the right to work, it's not just a bunch of general comments and, 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 and decisions of courts. I'll come back to, here's what's happening in Tanzania now. Here's what the decision in Australia meant. Here's what the reality is in India right now, and explain how international law ought to be applied to respond to those dilemmas.
Thanks for that great overview. Other features that are new this time include um, an expanded prelim section. I was particularly drawn to the new table of concordance to the Refugee Convention and Protocol. Can, um, can you explain that a little bit more? For Yeah, so this responds to one of the criticisms of, of, of the first edition, to be frank. Uh, and I want to just explain a little bit about how the book is organized and then Please. you can see how this fits. Because I decided in, that I wanted to organize the book not around sort of sterile Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Article 4, which is sort of mind-numbing. But frankly, there's no logic ordering of rights in the Refugee Convention. The civil rights aren't together. The, I mean, there, it's, it's just a mess. So I decided to organize the book around the actual refugee experience. Rights that are relevant when you're trying to leave your country or get into a new country. Rights upon arrival. Rights while you're waiting for a decision. Rights, rights while you're being protected and ultimately rights that enable you to have a solution to your status. And, and indeed, the Refugee Convention structurally is organized around those levels of attachment, but just not ordered chronologically to follow that pattern. So I've tried to sort of map the refugee world as the basis for understanding rights. One of the criticisms of the first edition was that for lawyers and judges, sometimes you just need to know what Article 17.2 says. Uh, you want to know what Article 34 says. And when I've mapped it onto the refugee life, which is a bit messier than that, it's not always so easy to find. So I came up with the idea of a table of concordance, which really follows the traditional structure of one, Article 2, Article 3, and tells you exactly where to find that information in the book if you prefer the more classical approach uh, uh, to uh, working with a book. By the way, one other thing that may interest uh, uh, readers, in particularly the non-lawyer readers, the, the activists and the social scientists. We've also expanded the index this time to the book so that every country that I talk about in the book, whether it's a country that produces refugees or that receives refugees, has its own index listing. So if what you want to understand is refugees in Rwanda or refugees from Sierra Leone, you can find exactly those extracts as well. So hopefully it'll have utility to those outside the legal community who are working on refugee rights as much as to those within it. Terrific. Of course, Cambridge these days will publish an ebook version both on Cambridge Core, our institutional platform that you can search across, um, or as individual device ebooks. That's a, that's a kind of newer world than the first edition. When, when but see, that's such a great development yeah. because what we really need, this is the kind of book I had one uh, you know, NGO activist say to me, in fact, the only thing I dislike about your book is it's so big. I can't take it out in the field with me. And, and, and so this development of an electronic edition of the book that's being issued right away will really, I hope, make life easier for people for whom carrying around you know more than a thousand pages is tough and by the way similarly my hope would be that for courts and tribunals and, and government officials who are working on these questions actually having access to an electronic edition would be something they could work on from wherever they are and across the entirety of their bureaucracies sure and, a, and other big tomes that we publish i find the practice very often is that a lawyer will, will search online but still reach back to the shelf and pull down yeah. Terrific. So now I'm going to quote a little bit back to you from your very eloquent introduction. You write so beautifully, Jim, Thank about you. this particular uh, new edition. And I'm just going to read you a couple of sentences and ask you to say a bit more on this. You talk about the need, your words, to acknowledge both the value and the weaknesses of each international refugee law and general international human rights law. The foundational premise that underlines that underlies the detailed analysis in the chapters that follow is that neither body of law is as effective standing alone as it is read in tandem with the other. Can you say a bit more on, on that tandem? Right. So, I mean, and, and this has been a bit of, in my view, a sterile academic debate uh, with some refugee lawyers championing the Refugee Convention and others from the international human rights world championing the covenants and specialized treaties. And the truth is, both of those optics are wrong. 
or both are right, depending on how you want to look at it. Glass half full, glass half empty. The, the truth is, if you think that 98% of the world's refugees live in states that are parties to the covenants, it's crazy for refugee lawyers not to take full advantage of those sources of entitlement. I mean, after all, refugees are human beings. Human beings have human rights, in addition to being refugees with refugee rights. So it's the amalgam of the two that this book offers, uh, and I weave them together all throughout every chapter. I treat them as one source of international legal entitlement. Some will ask, well, why do we still need the Refugee Convention if we've got all this great international human rights law? And it's a fair question. But, but the truth is, there are a whole lot of reasons why we still need it. There are some sort of refugee-specific concerns, things like personal status and naturalization and non-penalization for illegal entry that just aren't addressed by international human rights law because they're not relevant to citizens. There are things that are relevant to people who are non-citizens. There are some inappropriate assumptions in international human rights law. For example, there are all sorts of guarantees about fair judicial process but there's nothing about getting in front of a court in the first place, which is what refugees need. Uh, one of the things that worries me the most is that civil and political rights can be derogated from in national emergencies, which typically exist in many countries that receive refugees. Refugee rights are much harder to suspend. They're much more rigorous and they apply with much less flexibility. And when you get to socioeconomic rights, the value of refugee law is even greater. I mean, most socioeconomic rights are just duties of what's called progressive non-discriminatory implementation. Rights to work, et cetera, under the Refugee Convention are not subject to progressive implementation. They're immediate duties of result. And also, international economic rights can, in some poorer countries, be legally suspended for non-citizens. That is not true for the Refugee Convention. See. So when you read the two together, you've got this incredibly lively body of international human rights law being constantly reinterpreted by the treaty bodies and others. And we have those bodies looking to refugee lives much more frequently than they did 15 years ago. And then we add in the specific value of the refugee treaty into the mix. What you end up with is a really rich source of entitlement uh, that I think creative scholars and activists and lawyers can really bring to bear in order to make refugee lives much less horrible. Well done. Coming back to your eloquent introduction, later on in it, you give reasons, I quote again, for not engaging in depth with the full range of regional refugee and human rights norms, or even with globally applicable but more specialized human rights obligations. You go on to clarify in one single sentence, the goal of this study is to define the common core of human rights entitlements that inhere in all refugees, emphasis on all, in all parts of the world, simply by virtue of being refugees. Well, what led you to decide on that restriction, as it were? Uh, to preserving my sanity. Uh, I mean, honestly, what little is left. I mean, truly, this is such a huge field. I think this book has come in at something like 1,200 or 1,300 pages. It's a massive book in and of itself. To try to do justice to the full richness of all of the regional and national systems just would have been impossible. And, and quite frankly, you know, when I wrote those words, uh, similar words back in 2005, I said, you know, I really hope people will start writing about regional refugee systems. And one of the fabulous developments is they've done precisely that. Yes, the European system for sure, but equally the African and inter-American systems have really been developed by scholars and by the courts in those regions in ways that are super important. So I don't need to do that job. Other scholars are doing that job with much more expertise than me. What I wanted to do was to provide the bedrock from which those regional systems and national systems can spring because all of them, I mean, for example, the Court of Justice of the European Union has been emphatic on multiple occasions that the UN Refugee Convention is the bedrock for the European asylum system. The European system is, in other words, something to be built from, not to replace the UN refugee system. 
And so understanding that UN system, the one that binds three quarters of the governments in the world as the foundation for everything that happens nationally and regionally is I think a sufficient goal for this book. And then others will take the next step they have done and explain how that translates into the regional or national realities around the world. And, you know, what I want is this conversation to keep going. The idea behind this book, and I, and I do want to say, I've really struggled in this book to engage every single scholar who took up the arguments in the first edition. And I've tried to do justice to their critiques and to their compliments and to keep this conversation alive. Similarly with judges around the world. I don't always agree even with the most senior courts in the world, and I, I don't pull my punches. If I think the court is wrong, I'll try to explain why I think that's so, in the hope that we can keep this dialogue of justification going. That's the only way to keep refugee al alive, is for all of us to continually interrogate our assumptions and listen to each other. That sounds like an answer to my next question, which is what do you hope the impact will be? I mean, what you're saying is to keep the conversation alive. And, and that, that's exactly right. And, 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 you know, right now what we've seen is marvelous decision making by senior courts around the world based upon some phenomenally creative arguments from advocates. And I think that the way we engender that kind of legal creativity is by moving beyond, you know, facile assumptions, whether they're pro-refugee rights or what we need to constantly do is bump up against the hard facts of refugee life on the ground and see how those theories actually play out. And, and that's the goal of this book, is to really run law up against difficult facts, test it, interrogate it. And, and you know, I really do try to give a conclusion it's only my view. This is explicitly a normative book. It is not just a descriptive book. This is my view about what the treaty interpretation rules in the Vienna Convention, which by the way are outlined in a chapter that I'm really proud of in here, uh, the, the idea of an interactive approach to treaty interpretation that, that I think is somewhat novel. I, I think if we do what the Vienna Convention requires regional and national judges to do, and truly honor the words in light of context, object, and purpose, one rule, we can keep this refugee system alive. Every year, you know, more people are protected by refugee law than by any other international human rights law system. It's the most valuable human rights tool that we've got. And so ethically, my view is it's our obligation constantly to reinvigorate, revitalize it, take account of what's happening in the world. Here, here. So I have one last question for you, which is to look, look out over the horizon now in, in this early part of 2021 as to where the field of international refugee law might be heading in the next five years. That's a really tough one. Uh, I, I've been a critic of movements within the United Nations system that resulted in what's called the Global Compact on Refugees. I mean, even the word makes, it's a compact on refugees, not for refugees. Uh, I, I view it as a degradation of the commitments in the convention. I worry about the direction that uh, agencies and governments would like to push us in terms of more fluid, less rights-based, or alternatives to protection, uh, the so-called complementary pathways development as opposed to actually simply saying that refugees have refugee rights. Um, I worry about that. And I think that the real challenge is going to be for policymakers, but particularly judges, lawyers, and other advocates to insist that states live up to the duties they've signed on to not simply to see refugees as objects of charity, which I think is the direction that things are moving, uh, but rather as the holders of rights, as people who by virtue of their involuntary displacement are owed a new home by the world community. If sovereignty means anything in my view, 
it ought to mean that states that fail ultimately are places that the rest of us have an ethical responsibility to reach out and provide solace to those who've been victimized by those states that have failed. And if we can't do that, then sovereignty doesn't really mean much from an ethical optic. So refugee law really is, to my mind, perhaps the most tangible, direct remedy human beings have to actually vote with their feet to save their lives and their liberties. And I think that that idea of refugee protection and rights-based is very much under threat right now. And this book hopefully will provide the ammunition that those of us believe that human beings are not just the objects of charity, but rather need to be treated as rights regarding based holders of entitlements. Uh, can actually make their voices heard. What a wonderful note to end on. Tim Hathaway, thank you very much. We That's all look forward pleasure. to celebrating the second edition of Refugee Rights Under International Law, available soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for talking with me.